Live from San Francisco, California, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering DockerCon 2015. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media, with special thanks to Docker. Now your hosts, Stu Miniman and Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at DockerCon 2015 with 2,000 t-shirt clad and t-shirt grabbing techies that are really celebrating kind of the latest and greatest of what's going on in enterprise tech. We're excited to be here. It's our first time here. I think it's the third DockerCon. Second. Oh, well, yeah. No, well, somebody said there was no, a third. That's, you're right, there's the US show and then there's the European show. Okay, so there we the go. second year and the, of of the show. And Sorry, I'm joined Jeff. by my guest Stu, or uh, Stu Miniman, not my guest, my co-host, who has a t-shirt from DockerCon 2014, which he says is one of the favorite in his collection. So he's got the goods, get your 2015 when it could be a collector item someday. But we're joined here in this next segment by Patrick Shanazon, a member of the technical staff at Docker, working uh, directly with the big brain. So welcome to theCUBE. Hey, thanks Jeffrey, glad to be here. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit about uh, off camera and you've been at Google, you've been at VMware, you even go back to Netscape, so you've been in the business for a long time. You said you've been here for about three months. What was it about Docker that got you excited to, uh, to jump on board? Yeah, um, when I started using Docker more than a year ago, uh, the project was one year old. I was at Microsoft at that time, and um, when I moved from VMware to Microsoft, it was really to help Microsoft adopt open source. And so one of my roles there was to bring Linux and Java developers on Azure. So I started playing with Docker to develop new applications, and I really had the kind of aha moment I had when I used the Netscape Navigator back in 96, thinking this is really a, the kind of tool that will help us build our apps in a different way. In 96, I was building client-server applications, and I thought, wow, with a browser, we could build web applications with HTML, something on the server side, and then I spent the next 20 years building that kind of apps. When I started playing with Docker, I had exactly the same feeling, like this will change the way we're building applications. And so, at Microsoft, the last six months I spent there, my role was to take all the Docker ecosystem, most of the people you're going to talk to at that conference, and bring them on Azure, and after a while, I started discussing with Solomon, and uh, like we hit it off together, and uh, and he proposed me a role working directly with him on the future of the platform. And I'm a platform guy. I spent 10 years in my life building platforms, and then 10 years evangelizing them. So I just couldn't resist it. Yeah. Terrific. Patrick, talk a little bit about that because you know we we've definitely been you know on board with the whole platform discussion. We said we got to get out of talking about you know products move up to platforms, open APIs, yeah. you know build those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So why is that so critically important when you when you're building uh, you know what what you build? So what you, what we build at Docker or well, well, building well, platforms, platforms in general? Why, why is platforms in general so yeah, important? Yeah. So the reason I'm passionate about platform is that it's really a uh, a super leverage for the code that you're working on. When you're an engineer and you're working on code, uh, if you're working on code for a very specific application that will be used by 50 users or maybe a thousand users in your company, it's really different than if you're building infrastructure software platform that is going to be used by millions of developers out there. Uh, that's one reason. The other reason is uh, I see software as just building layers upon layers. In his keynote, Solomon talked about the fact that we're building on, on top of the shoulders of the giants. I think that's really the way software makes progress by getting higher and higher in the level of abstraction. And I used to introduce most of my talks by saying that, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm really disappointed by, by the technology we have today. When I was a kid, I used to read uh, Isaac Asimov science fiction books I thought, hey, when I'm 40, when I'm old, uh, there'll be flying cars and smart robots and all that, and what do we do? Like, we have like phones that can barely understand what we're talking about. So there, there's still lots of progress to be made in terms of the software we're building. Unfortunately, the, the limit today is in the developer productivity. If you look at Moore's law, in the past 40 years, the, the chips we're using are one billion times more powerful than 40 years ago. But the developer productivity is like nine times. The factor is nine, it's not one billion. And so anything that enhances developer productivity will really change things. I think Docker is one of these technologies, that's why I'm interested in being there. 
Yeah, can, can you help unpack that for us? You know, how, how do you measure kind of the developer productivity? You know, how do you supercharge that? Because absolutely, I think we agree with that 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 gap that's out there today. Yeah, so yeah. I can tell you about what I uh, what I noticed in the like past three or four jobs that I held. When I was at Google, I was doing Google App Engine. I was doing evangelism for that, and I started the evangelism team there. App Engine was really about let the developer focus on his code, push it to Google, and Google will scale it for you. So that definitely enhances productivity. However, that limits the kind of things that developers can do. Before that, Amazon invented the infrastructure as a service market, but then you still have to like manage your VMs and patch them, and there's lots of what we call yak shaving, like preparing the work instead of just doing the work. And I think Docker strikes the right balance of abstraction where as a developer, you're free to put whatever you want in your application, you package it up and then it's portable and you can move it anywhere. Yeah. So that really helps like working faster. Yeah, so Patrick, I, I was looking at some data that was released by well, one of the ecosystem partners today talking about how long containers live. And it seems like you know mm -hmm. most of them live really, really short periods of time, but yeah. then there are some that live a little longer. Very different from kind of VMs. Some people, I, I saw an article like a few months back that was like, you know, it, you know, uh, do you have mayflies or dinosaurs? And even, uh, I think the announcement today was actually New Relic that put out the data. It was like there's bacteria, uh, you know, in, yeah. in different life cycles. Maybe talk a little bit about how different that is and how that, that impacts the developer. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a really interesting thing that New Relic ship all these data. Uh, because containers are a different beast than VMs, um, and, and typically they can live for a, a much shorter duration because they are faster to start. And one of the things that you'll remark when you look at the history of computing is that when you have a 10 times increase in either power or, or a 10 times decrease in time, the nature of what you're doing with the machines changes. Right, and right. I think that's really what's happening with containers versus VM, because containers start in milliseconds, you can start them for something that will last a second or two, uh, as opposed to a VM where it takes 30 seconds to a minute to start it, and then you're going to keep only long-term wor long workloads in there. And so what we're seeing right now is that developers, because of that capability, are decomposing their apps into smaller and smaller units, and some of them have a different time period. And what's really interesting that this leads to a need for better orchestration tools, and uh, that's where all the competition is right now. If you look at the ecosystem, you have some people who are like complementing Docker in networking or volumes, uh, but then you also have lots of people who are trying to orchestrate containers, like Kubernetes from Google, there's Swarm from us, from Docker, there's Mesos, and there's at least eight of, or, or nine of them, and I, I have a whole talk on that. Uh, and I try to explain people what the various options are and how they can uh, find their way in that is that zoo of different container orchestration tools. Wow, yeah, so you know, one of the big announcements at the show today was the, uh, the OCP, the open container yep. you know, piece to standardize on you know, the, the lowest level, literally the runtime, right? Um, management and orchestration, I mean, that's, it, it's you know, even earlier in the game than it was, than it is with Docker. So uh, maybe can you walk us through a little bit about that? Give us a little insight if you say there's eight or more out there. How do we choose? How do you see that maturing over the next couple of years? I mean, you've got big players like you know Google and you yep. know Mesos and you know you guys and and others there. So maybe you could help unpack that landscape a little bit for us. Yeah. So one one of the um, one of the reasons we created the OCP is that there's a lot of innovation in the Docker ecosystem, and one of the things that really helps innovation is to standardize the pieces that everybody can agree on. And what we realized by looking at the AppC spec and at the Docker spec for, for images and runtime, is that under there, there was a, some common aspects and common values that we could standardize on. How to lay out the file system for running a container and how to specify how you're going to build a container for the processes you want to run in there. Uh, and so we just went to talk to all the industry partners and all of them agreed to join that uh, the Linux Foundation and that open compute, uh, uh, that open uh, container project. Uh, and with that, we'll have a solid basis uh, for innovating at the upper layer, which are at the orchestration layer. 
And now when you're talking about orchestration, so there are various point of views and various approaches to that. Uh, I'll summarize it like taking just the, the big three. Uh, Docker Swarm It's very simple. It gives you, it, it uses the same API as Docker itself. So it's a very uniform architecture, pretty elegant. It scales really well. It doesn't do everything, like for example, it doesn't do load balancing, but there are some plugins that allow you to do that. But it's super simple to set up. So that's Swarm. Then you have Mesos that has been around for a while, that was created at Twitter, that's using production at Netflix and lots of different places. And that's really designed to scale like clusters of tens of thousands of machines. Uh, it's pretty mature, and what we've been doing is that we've been working with Mesos uh, to do that integration between Swarm and Mesos. And so now there's a, a Swarm uh, framework for Mesos where the Mesos master can send some offers to Swarm as if it was one of the frameworks that it manages. And then the last one is Kubernetes from Google. So that's, uh, Kubernetes is designed to be like Borg, the internal system that runs all the workloads at Google. And Ku Kubernetes, I'd say, has um, slightly different concepts. For example, they have the concept of pods, where you gather several containers together. The way the namespaces are the, and the isolation is slightly different wi within these. And then uh, they have this notion of service, so they provide you load balancing uh, and replication controller for managing how your uh, various workloads go around. And I'd say, I, I'd add to that, there's also Cloud Foundry, which, which is part of that. Uh, which was a platform as a service that's trying to reinvent itself as a container orchestration tool. So we're seeing a lot of different activities in that space with lots of slightly different point of views and that's what's great about our market, there's lots of innovation. Yeah, th thank you Patrick, I really appreciate you walking through that because what, what's tough when you look on the outside is they're not, you know, it's not a binary decision as you said, you know, Swarm and Mesos, how they can actually fit together, you know, from kind of Solomon yourself and your team, you know, how do you sort out, how much do you just kind of let, oh, we'll let the ecosystem handle that versus we want to have a core Docker project uh, that handles that. You know, we, we've been having this discussion with like OpenStack for the last couple of years is what goes in the core, what gets built out, what gets built on time, um, and maybe that'll probably lead into the plugins that you worked on, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Actually, that's a pretty good transition to that plugins project where you cannot do it all by yourself when you're building a platform, so it's really super important to take good care of defining the extension points for your platform where the ecosystem can take over. On the other hand, you want your system to be useful by default. So we have this philosophy at Docker of uh, batteries included but swappable. And one of the things that Solomon announced in the keynote today is that we're going to have Docker networking, so we have native multi-host networking in Docker now, and it's pretty powerful. But we also spend some time defining extension points for networking so that you can swap, other, swap our networking with other providers. So we developed the plugin with a Weave, uh, but there's uh, six different plugin providers who already are creating plugin, including, I think there's VMware in there and Cisco and a few others. Uh, and for volumes, we, defi we define one for, uh, for Flocker to be able to move uh, your stateful containers around in a cluster, and that could be automated via the orchestration player uh, that's orchestrating all that. Now, that said, we're trying to make the Docker platform solve the needs of the user, which means we have a tool for provisioning machines, we have a tool for provisioning machines that belong to a cluster. We have a tool for clustering, which is Swarm. Uh, we have a tool for assembling your application that's called Compose, and then we have Docker Engine itself. And we even have a UI called Kitematic, and there's a Windows version that shipped, um, um, I think, uh, today. So how do you decide what you guys are going to work on, what's really core to the platform versus the, the, the things you want to li lean on the ecosystem for? I, I love that, batteries included but swappable. And it, because most people, to really be successful around a platform, usually you start as an application and then you move to a platform because people generally don't buy platforms, right? But it sounds like with Docker, the, the productivity improvement for the engineers was so instantly recognizable that they're jumping in with both feet. But how will you define the platform that's going to be your core piece versus the open source piece versus the uh, ecosystem piece? I'd say we're looking at uh, how, how do we define the, what should be in the platform. I'd say we look at the end game, like what kind of applications are people building? Uh, 
are developers building, developers are our customers, and uh, how how can we help them build these? And these days, what developers need to build is uh, uh, distributed applications. Uh, there's another aspect, one of the main success of Docker to me is tied to the right timing. Docker appeared right at the time when enterprises were adopting cloud, and when enterprises adopted public cloud, they wanted hybrid architecture, so they wanted portability. They wanted to be able to run workloads internally behind the firewall, but also go to Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, and probably two or three of these providers. And Docker with the portability just allows for that kind of hybrid architecture. Uh, so I think this hybrid architecture plus building distributed applications and making that super easy to do, that's kind of what Docker is about. Uh, and that's what Solomon presented this morning. It's really about creating a layer to help people program the internet, leverage the internet as a substrate uh, of machines to program. All right, so actually I uh, got, got a question came in through our cloud, crowd chat engagement platform. Sure. We said we, we actually containerized the conversation from all the social feeds that are out there. Very it says, good. who manages the containers? You know, I, I think back, you know, when we went from just, you know, server managers to when it was the VM, it kind of yep. changed that role. And when we get to the container, maybe you could talk about, you know, how, how that how that changes things. So that's a super interesting question because to me that's one of the area uh, for containers. Containers, Linux containers with Docker are only two years old. Uh, they started really taking off two years ago. And to me, while on the developer side, there are lots of tools, on the orchestration side, we start to have lots of tools, but the jury's still out about which ones should we use. On the management side, there's a big, a big set of things to invent and to create. And so right now, you see people who are building monitoring tools. Uh, New Relic is a good example. Uh, Sysdig is another uh, project that's, that's pretty good at that. Uh, Rancher has an option in there. There's a flurry of people who are doing monitoring and for management of containers. For uh, one example, Weave, who was building that overlay network and the, the network plugin, recently they, um, they released uh, something called WeaveScope that lets you introspect all your containers and look at the network, how it looks like. There's lots of management tools to be invented still. That's an area which to me, I think is still uh, underdeveloped and that will probably explode in the next year. And, and I'd say the, the existing providers of management tool will probably all have some offering in there. I think VMware is starting to, they, they made an announcement this morning. Uh, they already have something around uh, identity management for containers or, or yeah, I think it's about identity management. Lightwave, uh, and they're, they're probably going to, this morning what they announced with Project Bonville and the other project, I forgot the name, uh, I think it's about making containers like first class citizen into vSphere. Uh, so they really want to manage containers. All the other players are going to probably do the same, but I expect with all the innovation, there will be some new entrants and new players in, in uh, Docker container management. It's laying out the roadmap for the entrepreneurs out there. Yeah, I mean, if you're in software today, uh, there, there's a, a whole open wild west. Yeah. yeah. Conquer, so, conquer. So, 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 Patrick, you know, you, you said you get to work directly with Solomon. Lay out that roadmap. You know, give, give us a little direction. What kind of areas should we be looking for? What kind of milestones or, you know, high-level things should we be looking for by the time we come back to DockerCon 2016? Um, yeah. 2016 is a long time away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you so, guys think in two month increments, not six month or yeah, year increments, exactly, right? So. Exactly, so right now, all, all the things I can talk about is like, for example, the plugin model, we need to enhance it. That was the first draft. Uh, we need to make it better, maybe create some new extension points for plugins. One of the things that, one of the big work item that Solomon talked about, about the plumbing. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we, uh, we released something called RunC, that is, uh, and all the code of lib container to the open container project. So that's one of the first plumbing layer that, that we're giving out. We're going to output more and more pieces of Docker as plumbing pieces. So that, that's a big, big set of work. Uh, and then on the Docker side, enhancing the developer workflow. And on the hub side, enhancing all the developer workflow online for helping developer collaborate and developers and operations 
collaborate into creating and operating these applications. Yeah, so, so without even having to tell me any kind of specifics, I'm, I'm curious though, you know, I, I work for a lot of big enterprise tech companies, yep. and you have the people that work on stuff that are 12 to 18 months out there, and the people who work on stuff three to five years out there, I mean, you started three months ago and worked on all these plugins. The you know OCP stuff happened in three weeks. Yep. You know, is there a three-year plan, or you know, you know, what what are kind of the the, the time frames that you guys plan in uh, when, when you look at uh, you know Docker? I guess you should ask the question directly to Solomon. Yeah, we'll have him on tomorrow. <laughs> we'll have him on so. later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, Patrick, uh, before we let you go, again, I, I love that you've got such a great historical perspective, and I love your enthusiasm, and you know, you've been in the business a long time, and you're clearly you know, really excited. As, as we let you go, kind of what are your thoughts of why this is such an important moment in time? What's happening here on the ground that people that aren't here really need to know? If you're a developer today, uh, to me, Docker is like what the Netscape browser was when it came out uh, in 95. Uh, so you, you saw how client-server applications gave way to web applications for the past 20 years. If you're a developer today, you should get started with Docker and with containers uh, because that's probably the kind of technology you're going to use for the next 20 years. Right, and, and be a lot more productive, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, interesting, if I just want to bounce one thing off of you, we were talking about when public cloud first came out, it created what we called you know, stealth IT. Yeah. And really what Docker's doing is it's almost creating dev IT. It's you know putting you know IT so that the developers can just go do it you know without having to think of the rest of that. There, there's um, it, it's I mean there's a name for that. It's yeah. called DevOps. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure as code, and uh, and to me DevOps is really about Dev and Ops working together more than like fighting each other. And I think that movement is happening in the industry. I don't know if you saw the ING the talk that the ING IT manager gave at uh, DockerCon EU in December. It's online, I, I highly advise you to watch it. Basically what this guy was explaining is uh, they reorg completely their IT, they fired a lot of people in, in the way, and then all their IT people are developers. People who are doing operations and developers, they're all developers, and everything is code. Infrastructure is code and your application is code. Uh, I think Docker just helps that reality, that new reality to happen. But on the DevOps side, there's also, like, it's not only about products, uh, it's about culture, people, and organizations, and there's lots of work to do in this area. Yeah, exactly. We always find that the people in the process are the hard part, right, compared to exactly. the technology. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Patrick Shanazan, thanks for stopping by. Uh, from the member of the technical staff working with Solomon right in the uh, right in the right in the engine room, if you will. So uh, thanks for stopping by, uh, Jeff Rick here with Stu Miniman. We're at DockerCon 2015. We're having a ball. Hope you are too. We'll be right back with our next segment after this short break. Thanks for watching.